Aaron Douglas, the leading painter and illustrator of the Harlem Renaissance. He was born in Topeka, Kansas in 1899. His mother recognized his talent as a boy and supported his dream of being an artist. She gave him a magazine of the reproduction of Tanner's painting Christ and Nicodemus when he was a child. He designed the covers of two of his high school yearbooks. After high school, Douglas enrolled at the University of Nebraska as the first black student in its fine arts program, graduating with a Bachelor's of Fine Arts in 1922. He worked as an art teacher at Lincoln High School in Kansas for the next two years. After a few years of teaching at Lincoln High School and on the advice of friends, in the summer of 1925, Douglas moved to New York City at the height of the New Negro Renaissance or the Harlem Renaissance. It was a time of extraordinary creativity among African-American artists. His work came to the attention of Charles S. Johnson, a sociologist and editor of the Urban League publication called The Opportunity. Douglas also met Bavarian painter Winoff Rice through him and became the artist's prize student. Rice exposed Douglas to the Vienna Secession movement, the bold colors and forms of German Expressionism and the abstraction of African art. Rice encouraged Douglas to take up mural painting and explore his cultural background for themes and subjects. Douglas' use of African design and subject matter in his work brought him to the attention of William Edward Bugoff, W.E. Du Bois, and Elaine Locke, two of the formative intellectuals of the Harlem Renaissance. W.E. Du Bois and Elaine Locke pressed young African-American artists to express their African heritage and African-American folk culture in their art. Within months of meeting Elaine Locke and W.E. Du Bois, Douglas began illustrating covers for leading black publications, again like The Opportunity. The Opportunity, the official journal of the National Urban League, and The Crisis, the publication of the NAACP that was edited by Du Bois. You just watch, he wrote in a letter to Alta Sawyer, his future wife. He said, and I quote, things are going to break and break fast, end of quote. He developed a style of angular, abstracted, figurative silhouettes, merging African art, cubism, and art deco into a strikingly modern style for the energy and optimism of the jazz age. Elaine Locke called him a pioneering Africanist and used his illustrations in his famous uh, anthology called The New Negro, published in 1925, in which his classic essay was, and is, The Legacy of the Ancestral Arts appeared. This is um, a piece that he created, I think it's a woodcut called Jahada, the Tribal Woman, from 1925. As a member of the Renaissance Circle, Douglas also illustrated books by Conti Cullen, Langston Hughes, and James Walden Johnson. This is a portrait that he created, again, a woodcut of, the, of Conti Cullen from 1926. This is a portrait of Langston Hughes that he made in 1926. Both of these images are woodcuts of young poets of the Harlem Renaissance of the 20s and the 30s. His illustrations also appeared in Vanity Fair, Theater Arts, and American Mercury. This period of intense creativity in the visual arts, literature, music, and dance inspired African Americans to be proud of their heritage. Some of Douglas's best known works and most famous illustrations were done in collaboration with poet James Walden Johnson in 1927 for his book of poems called God's Trombone, Seven Negro Sermons in Verse. And that's what you're looking at is that wonderful collection by James Walden Johnson. And again, the illustrations um, by um, Aaron Douglas called The Book of God's Tr uh, Trombone from 1927. Let's look at a few of these. 
This is called the study for God's trombone. Again, this is 1926. And this, as you saw in the collection of, of images, is called the creation from 1927. Stories from the Bible, African-American spirituals, and culture inspired James Walden Johnson's poems. Johnson's prose, like describing the creation, and I quote, and God stepped out on space, and he looked around and said, I am lonely. I'll make me a world, end of quote, clearly stuck a chord with Aaron Douglas. Subtle, overlapping, and muted shades of gray, yellow, and brown note a timeless mystical realm for the scene, including a stirring image of a solitary figure gazing up at the hand of God. Douglas produced a series of gouache paintings to accompany James Walden Johnson's sermons, in which he sil his silhouette figures appeared in a flattened abstract space divided by angular and curving lines, such as this one called Crucifixion. Again, this is from 1927. This is another piece from 1927 called The Prodigal Son. As a result of the acknowledgement for God's trombones, he was asked often to illustrate other literary works. Douglas was among the first African Americans to conscientiously incorporate African imagery, culture, and history into his art. Although he had never visited Africa, the painter was able to create his images from his imagination. He combines the influence of ancient Egyptian sculpture with the modern Art Deco style. In his collection, Douglas included illustrations of The Judgment Day, Let My People Go, Go Down, Death, and this piece which is called Noah's Ark. This is also from 1927, as well as the crucifixion. Later, Aaron Douglas was commissioned to paint murals and historical narratives relating to black history and cultural pride. Douglas, like many other visual artists during the Harlem Renaissance, collaborated with various poets and writers. 1928, French writer Paul Moran commissioned Douglas to illustrate a book of fictitious sketches reflecting black culture and roots in Africa. His results was called Black Magic. When Douglas collaborated with various poets, he also desired to capture the black expression. And the name of this particular piece is called Black Magic Illustration Charleston, and this is 1929. He spent a lot of time watching patrons in Harlem nightclubs. Douglas said that most of his paintings captured in this, in these nightclub images were mainly inspired by the music played. According to Douglas, the music sounds were heard everywhere. This piece, Charleston, narrates a story of a white woman's fatal attraction to a black saxophonist. Pay attention to some of the images, like the noose in the center of the painting and the hands that are clutching in the foreground behind you. Now that you know that the theme is understanding why there's a noose and the hands clenching. And for those of you who still don't get it, uh, black and white relationships were not approved of, approved of at this particular time. Congo is an African-American performer modeled on the uninhibited Josephine Baker, who joins an ecstatic drumming and dance ritual in a Parisian bar. She foresees her death in a vision of the Mississippi and her Creole grandmother, who is, in, who is that light beam that you see in his, his piece. Again, this is magic illustration. It's Congo 1929, and this is part of his commission. Douglas and his wife were popular hosts to the Harlem cultural elite, said Arna Bontemps who said this, and I quote, everybody dropped in. This was really a meeting place for all the artists and intellectuals in Harlem. The apartment was decorated with Douglas's own paintings. Having a book jacket by him almost became a hallmark of the Harlem period in literature, end of quote. And this, of course, is an image of Douglas and his wife. 
Aaron Douglas was called the Dean of African American Painters. When Du Bois and others tried desperately to convince painter Henry O. Tanner to return from Europe and establish a school of Negro painting. It's thought that this piece, which is called Dance Magic from 1930, was very similar to one that the Sherman Hotel commissioned for the College Ballroom, which was an white-only jazz venue in 1930s. And as you know, this particular piece is taken from the Black Magic series, and what he's, he's done with this particular design is simply taken the white woman out of this, out of the center of the composition. Around 1928 to 1930, he studied in Paris on a grant from the Barnes Foundation. The reason is unclear because around 1928, before he met Albert C. Barnes, a wealthy man who collected modern art and established an art school on his estate in Pennsylvania, he offered Douglas a scholarship and a stipend to study at his school. Anyway, Locke and Langston Hughes introduced him to a wealthy white lady named Charlotte Mason, who wanted to be called the grandmother. She and her husband believed in the spiritual power of primitive and child race, terms they used for African American and Native Americans. Godmother supported, directed, and controlled through her money and emotional approval or disapproval of black writers and artists specifically Locke, Hughes, and Hurston. Hughes later wrote that she considered black people, and I quote, as America's great link with the primitive, that there was mystery and mysticism and spontaneous harmony in their souls, and that we have a deep well of the spirit within us and that we should keep it pure and deep, end of quote. So uh, a little bit about that school that um, Albert C. Barnes wanted to send Aaron Douglas to. Grandmother was not having it. She wanted him, Aaron Douglas, to stay as, she said, a primitive artist. She did not want him educated. And by the way, the name of this piece is called Labor Symbolic Negro History, and this is from 1930. Douglas also painted portraits and landscapes. He used a different style in these easel paintings. They tend to be more realistic and romantic. This is one of them from 1930, and this is called the Old Waterworks. The godmother called had become so persistent and disruptive that Douglas delayed projects and went to Nashville, Tennessee, where he was commissioned to create a set of murals for the Memorial Library at the Fisk University. Douglas admired the university for its promotion of the liberal arts, even under pressure to become a technical school. He chose to depict drama, philosophy, music, poetry, and science in his mural series for the Fisk called A Thing of Beauty. And this is one of his um, mural paintings. This is called Drama from 1930. And you can see he has, um, you could see that he recycles a lot of his images. This is called Portrait Symbolic Negro History Series, also commissioned by Fisk. From Nashville, Tennessee, he went to Chicago to paint a mural. I'm not aware of how many he painted there. This work was painted between 1930 and 1933 an allegorical representation of the role that African Americans played in the economic and physical development of Chicago. The painting shows a laboring man and an enchained mother looking at an urban vista. It's called The Founding of Chicago. It was made in 1933, and basically it discusses the founder of Chicago, who is called Du Sable. He was supposed to be a French man part black, part native, and some kind of combination of this. Supposedly, Douglas and his wife returned from Paris around 1933 without money. New York had changed many things such as more, there were more artists and fewer commissions. 
1934, Douglas was commissioned under the sponsorship of the WPA to paint a series of murals for the 135th Street branch of the New York Public Library. The four-panel series called Aspects of Negro Life symbolically trace African-American history from their origins in Africa through slavery, emancipation, and the Great Migration from the rural South to the industrialized urban North. What you're looking at now is called the study for aspect Negro life from 1934. In this study for the first panel, you have a man and a woman doing an African dance to the beat of drums as concentric circles of light emphasize the heart and rhythm of their movement. A sculpture floating in a center circle above the dancer's head suggests the importance of spirit in African culture. African sculptures, jazz music, dance, and geometric forms heavily influenced Douglas's style with flat, hard edges and repetitive designs. Douglas laborers radiate dignity, self-respect, and self-sufficiency. One reoccurring image is the contemplative man with a hoe. This figure reminds viewer of the black sharecropper who generally did not enjoy the celebratory spirit that white uh, workers did in the 1930s. The name of this particular panel is called the Deep South. Again, Negro life from 1934. Because of the desperate economic and social conditions of the 1930s, artists developed a renewed interest in displaying the plight of laborers and disenfranchised individuals. The Ashcan School had dealt with these themes earlier at the turn of the 20th century. Social realism aimed at social change and the mural seemed uniquely able to argue this as a public art form. For many artists, mural painting was also a reaction against the decadence of art displayed in galleries and private homes in an era of extreme poverty. Several muralists dealt with social problems and suffering of the Depression era, but the majority of the work embodied a naive form of social realism, inspiring Americans to reflect on their heritage of revolution, hard work, and religion in an attempt to bring back prosperity, such as Douglas placing the university and the factory side by side on top of the hill as the preacher points to them. The name of this piece is called Slavery Through Reconstruction. And so this is the larger piece. When you look at it, you see the concentric circles are the center. You see the reverend has one hand, the guy in the center, has one hand on the Bible and he points to um, the university and the factory, right? Those are the ideas. You might dream of going north to the university but end up in the factory. If you look at the upper left hand corner, you see what drove the the black person or black people out of the South, and that would be the cruelty of the South. And you see KKK uh, riding horses. That's what those pointy shapes are. And then of course, in the foreground, you see planters. Um, they look like they're, or, or laborers pulling cotton. And so they have all of the aspect in here. He has all of the aspect of the, again, of the, of the Southerner leaving um, the South to go North. This image shows Douglas showing his murals to author Schomburg. The library murals attempted to give a symbolic representation of certain aspects of Negro life. The Schomburg Center houses one of the most comprehensive collections in the world devoted to documenting the history and culture of people of African descent. Uh, Mr. Schomburg was a major supporter of art and artists in the African American community. In fact, before he started uh, working at the 135th Street branch of the New York Public Library, he was organizing exhibitions there for African American artists. 
Uh, one of those that he was especially impressed with was uh, Aaron Douglas, the leading visual artist of the Harlem Renaissance. The four murals that are uh, held by the Schomburg Center entitled Aspects of Negro Life were painted by Aaron Douglas in 1934 and are generally considered to be the most significant works that he produced. One of the most exciting acquisitions that we've had uh, in the course of my tenure here uh, took place here in Harlem at 409 Edgecombe Avenue. I was sitting in my office one day and I received a phone call from a friend of mine who lived in the 409 Edgecombe building. She told me that uh, there were some old trunks downstairs in one of the uh, rooms of the building and that they were planning to throw them out the next day. Uh, she said those old trunks had some interesting names on them, people who had been major historical figures in Harlem who had lived in that building. Names like W.B. Du Bois and uh, Aaron Douglas and Thurgood Marshall and other folk of that nature who had lived in this um, extraordinary apartment complex. Among the most significant materials acquired during that acquisition was a collection of letters written by Aaron Douglas to his wife, Alta Douglas. The Douglas trunk also included a copy of the magazine Fire, as well as a manifesto that he had written for Fire, a magazine published by some of the young uh, artists and writers of the Harlem Renaissance, including Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston, among others. This is a manifesto uh, for the magazine Fire, devoted to younger Negro artists, uh, written by Aaron Douglas, and it reads, uh, I'm writing this to give you a more detailed account of our project and of ourselves. We are all under 30. We have no get-rich-quick complexes. We espouse no new theories of racial advancement socially, economically, or politically. We have no access to grind. At the beginning of the 20th century, black people were believed to have no history or culture. Mr. Schomburg and others gathered the evidence to disprove this myth. And today, we have a collection of more than 10 million items of evidence documenting the place and role of people of African descent. I think it was Langston Hughes who described this mural Song of Tower, Aspect of Negro Life from 1934. This is what Langston Hughes said. He says, Song of the Towers addresses African-American entry into the northern cities. The panel depict a figure fleeing from the hand of serfdom. It symbolizes the migration of African-American people from the rural South and the Caribbeans to the urban industrial centers of the North just after World War I. There's also a saxophonist standing on the wheel of life. The jazz musician symbolizes the creativity of 1920s and the freedom for the new Negro. The panel series of murals ends on what Douglas himself calls a depressing note, that of another imposing hand, this time of hunger, poverty, and death, are reaching claimed a dejected black man during the depression. The aspiration of reaching the urban industrial environment is critiqued here through the machine cog that can only briefly hold. This is a portrait of Aaron Douglas in front of Song of Tower. Um, again, that's the last series of four murals that Douglas painted in 19. 34. This is by um, a friend of his named Betty Renau. This is one of Douglas's most unique symbolic landscape called Triborough Bridge um, from 1935. It depicts unemployed New Yorkers in a park in the winter with a lot of snow and industry. Yet it's supposed to symbolize construction and hope. There's so much to say about this, but let's keep going. After 1928, Douglas's work was wildly, widely exhibited. In addition to his murals at Fisk, he executed murals for the Harlem YMCA, the Conti Cullen branch of the New York Public Library, the Sherman Hotel College and Ballroom in Chicago, and Bennett College in Greenboro, North Carolina. Most major museums and many private collectors own his work. But 
let's talk a little bit about this painting. Again, this shows you uh, the name of this painting let's talk about is called Window Cleaning 1935. It shows you his skill level and that he can also uh, make what's called easel paintings. Douglas was interested in blacks participating in the industrial labor force. In many of his murals, the factory symbolizes black progress, a prize on the racial mountain. But Douglas also recognized that industrial jobs conflicted with other goals, such as education, pointing to the earlier split in the African-American community between Booker T. Washington, who advocated vo vocational training for blacks, and W.E. Du Bois, who argued for a liberal arts education. Douglas also commented on the failures of the factory system, often associated with urban areas in the North, which seemed to hold so much promise for blacks in the 1920s. This is called Aspiration, uh, 1936. And again, you can see that it, it pretty much goes in hand in hand in what uh, Douglas is, is talking about for the North. You could have education, education in science, math. You can be a performer, right? There's hands up that are in the foreground that's chained, right? So to leave, to leave serfdom or to leave enslavement, you want to be educated. Most critics saw Douglas's work as a breath of fresh air. His work symbolized geometric formulas, circles, triangles, rectangles, and squares became the dominant design motif for him. Many publishers, editors, and artists were impressed, but some academically trained African-American critics, such as James A. Porter, considered his work grotesque. Few realized that the classic black silhouette on Greek vases inspired Aaron Douglas. So when you look at um, the the Greek vase that I just saw you saw and this particular piece called Enter Bondage, you can see that not only has he taken the inspiration for, for um, from Greek vases, but he's turned it on its ear and he's added other flavors, such as that those uh, images have such a cubis kind of quality to them. In 1937, Douglas received a grant from the Julius Roswell Fund for Studies in the South and Haiti. That same year, he founded the Art Department of the Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. A few years later, he accepted a part-time teaching position at Fisk University while he completed a master's degree at the Teacher College um, in Columbia, at Columbia University. This is a painting of his wife called Alta, his wife, uh, from 1936. Then in 1940, Aaron Douglas moved to Nashville, Tennessee, where he taught at Fisk University for 29 years until he retired in 1966. After Douglas went to Fisk, he started making easel easel scale, ash can style landscapes and portraits like Boy with Toy Plane uh, that you see here in 1938. You can see that his, that his style has changed in his easel paintings. There's more texture uh, in them. Um, he, he fluctuates between um, being concerned about texture and color. Aaron Douglas was the Harlem Renaissance artist who best exemplified the new Negro philosophy. He said, our problem is to conceive, develop, and establish an art era. Not white art painting black. Let's bear our arms and plunge them deep through laughter, through pain, through sorrow, through hope, through disappointment, into the very depths of the souls of our people and drag forth material, crude, rough, neglected. Then let's sing it, dance it, write it, paint it. Let's do the impossible. Let's create something transcendentally material, mystically objective, earthly, spiritually, earthly, dynamic. This is end of quote. The name of this painting is called Building More Stately Mansions from 1944. 
This is a portrait that he made uh, in 1969. This is a portrait of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Mary Jane McLeod Bethune was born July the 10th, 1875 in Mayville, South Carolina and died May 18, 1955 in Do Do uh, Daytona Beach, Florida. She was a tireless educator born to former slaves. She is best known for founding a school in 1904 that later became part of Bethune-Cookman College at Daytona Beach. She was president of the college from 1923 to 1942 and again from 1946 to 1947. One of the few women in the world who served as a college president. Bethune worked for the election of Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1932 and attempted to get him to support a law against lynching. She was also a member of Roosevelt's Black Cabinet, among other leadership positions and organizations for women and African Americans. The National Park Service preserved Mary McFlood Bethune House as a National Historic Site, and her sculpture is located in Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C., and this is a portrait of her. This is a self-portrait of Douglas. In his 70s, he refurbished and repainted the mural at Fisk that he had painted in the 30s. He started to redo them in terms of color. He said, and I quote, he says, things with color I didn't know how to do at that time, end of quote. In 1971, there was a renewed appreciation of his pivotal road in aesthetically linking the African past to black American life. Douglas died in Nashville, Tennessee on February the 3rd, 1979. Although some of Aaron Douglas's paintings were portraits, landscapes, or genre scenes, some of his paintings had themes of what life was like for African Americans. I'm going to show you a few of his paintings. Unfortunately, I do not have the date for them. This is called Power Plant Harlem. Um, again, there's no date. Now, remember, many people called Aaron Douglas the father of Black American art. Here's another one of his um, illustrations called To Make a Race Book. This is a woodcut of Paul Robeson, another image of Paul Robeson, and this is a self-portrait. Years later, the artist Romare Bearden, who admired Aaron Douglas's craftsmanship, he responded as follows, and this is what he said, and I quote, technique in itself is not enough. It is important for the artist to develop the power to convey emotion. The artist's technique, no matter how brilliant it is, should never obscure his vision. End of quote. 